the Royal House of Chronicles, who agree on who's the king. And, um, and of course, there, Ilium or Troy, Priya. Ilium's going to show for now, no, but in a minute, maybe we will. Athens. And Thebes. Athens, okay, and Thebes. Sometimes the three playwrights use uh, the same myths. Um, so um, Electra features in all three of them, and um, and Orestes, of course, because they both um, did the act to kill their mother. But they they all had their different perspective. Um, Aeschylus, um, according to him, um, what they did, what these two children did to kill their mother, was a necessary, even though dreadful, deed necessary because the gods had said to the children to do that. And Sophocles again, in fact, according to Sophocles, that was a glorious deed. Again, because the gods told them to do it, so you obey the gods. But Euripides, later on, is not so sure anymore, you know, not, doesn't really believe that the gods, you know, should dictate what people do. So that's why he's more modern. According to him, Orestes had done a deed which should never have been committed. So that kind of distinguishes him from the other two. Now the audiences uh, who were there um, watching these plays, they would have been familiar with all these myths. You know, I mean, they were great myths. They were on and on and on for centuries, so people knew them. And, and so um, Often there was a lot of irony there in the sense that if they watched Oedipus, for instance, and they knew the story about him having married his mother, and can you imagine how they would have been feeling, you know, kind of looking at him and, and don't you know, you know, <laughs> when are you going to find out, you know, and all the rest, or please don't find out, you know, whatever. So, you know, it made it a lot more interesting uh, for them to... to, to to see this place, and as I said, everybody was invited to go and watch the games. So it was really a very, a very kind of um, egalitarian thing to do. Um, however, even though gods were involved in some of the plays, um, the emphasis was, especially by Euripides, on on um, human relationships, um, husbands and wives, Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, Medea and Jason or fathers and daughters, Agamemnon and Electra, uh, mothers and daughters, Clytemnestra and Electra. Um, who else? Uh, brothers and sisters, Antigone and her brother that she died for because she wanted to bury him. She loved him. Um, but a lot of these relationships, of course, are not normal at all. They're not like most of the relationships we all have, husbands, wives, daughters, mothers, fathers, and all the rest, they were totally out of, you know, what is considered normal. Um, extreme hatred, extreme love, you know, um, all these things um, that, not, um, that most people don't have. In fact, um, um, the chorus in Electra tells Electra that her grief for the murder of her father was, and I quote, beyond the common measure. Yes, you grieve that your father was killed, but you need to go and kill your mother for it. But then uh, Euripides is great because he actually lets Electra and Clytemnestra have this wonderful dialogue where each one tells the other what exactly they think of each other. So Electra doesn't just go and kill the father only because the mother you know, killed him. Sorry, the mother because she killed the father. But uh, because there's a lot more behind that. You know, Electra tells her mother that her mother had a bad character before, before everything that happened with her husband. And, and so she goes on and on and on and accuses her mother. And, and it's a great dialogue between the two. So you get all that in this uh, place. So now, um, and just very quickly, there, there are uh, some um, female characters in Euripides who are the sacrificial type, who are willing to die for someone else that they love. 
and, they, and also there are the vindictive types who mm -hmm. go ahead and kill someone because they're vindictive. So um, Antigone is willing to die for her brother, so she's the good, the good woman in the tragedies. Um, Iphigenia, the daughter of Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, also dies so that her father can start the war in Troy, or can set off for the war. Polyxene, Priam and Hecabe's daughter, also dies uh, willingly in the end because um, the Greeks wanted to sacrifice a virgin in honor of Achilles when he was killed. And they chose Priam's daughter and they sacrificed her. In the end, she just goes willingly for the good of whatever. And the bad women, of course, uh, Clytemnestra is the one who murders her husband and his um, uh, mistress. Um, Hecabe, the, the wife of uh, Priam and Priam, Priam, yeah, Priamos in Troy, she actually, she's a, a mother in a lot of pain. Her children have been killed, her son was murdered by the king of Thrace, and she goes and kills his two children to take revenge. So revenge is certainly a subject that, a subject that is there in all the great tragedies. And Medea, the one we're going to look at now, who kills her two sons to take revenge upon her unfaithful husband, Jason. <coughs> so, um, so far, okay, um, shall I tell you now a little bit about the social context of the play? Medea was performed in 431 uh, during one of the annual festivals and it won third prize. Uh, Euripides wasn't very, very popular in his time, didn't win many prizes, but he was very popular later on in the next century. Um, the audience would have been sitting directly below the Parthenon. The Parthenon was built in the 440s under Pericles. Now, at the premiere of the play, as it happens these days, um, all the most well-known, most eminent Athenians would have been there, Pericles would have been there, of course, the great statesman and general of Athens. He was in his 60s then, um, so that was still the golden age. Um, Pericles actually died three years after that uh, because of the plague, the great plague in Athens. If you've heard about that, a lot of people died, and he was one of them. He would have had with him Aspasia, his consul, or partner, as we say now, they were not married. And she had come from the east, from Miletus. Very strong personality, very uh, educated woman, strong intellect, played a significant part in, um, in the public life um, of uh, that century. One of the few women who played such a part. The historians, Herodotus and Thucydides would have been there as well. Herodotus wrote the, the history of the Persian Wars. Thucydides was to write the history of the Peloponnesian Wars later on, they're all there. Socrates, who would have been about 40 at the time, and they say he would have certainly been there as well. Aristophanes, the com who wrote comedies later on and satirized Euripides as well in his, com in his comedies. And um, if you're going to read uh, one play by one comedy by Aristophanes, you could um, do well to uh, read Lysistrat. Lysistrat. Mm -hmm. And Sophocles would have been there as well. He actually won second prize there, whereas um, Euripides won third prize. So now, let's go to the play so we can... Um, shall I put the light on so you can see the hand up? Oh, yeah. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Lots of light here. Um, now, I gave you the handout with some um, extracts from the play. And it's good to read them so we can discuss them. Uh, the story of um, the story of the play. Do you all know the story of Jason and the Argonauts? So Jason went to get the Golden Fleece from um, Colchis near around the Black Sea somewhere. All right up the Golden so all the way there. So. Um, came back, um, things happened at home in Thessalia, near Volos. He was kicked out of there with his um, wife, 
Medea, his new wife that he brought with him. She helped him to uh, bring the golden fleece back to Greece. They got married, they had two children, they were kicked out of Thessalia, they ended up in Corinthus. Corinthus, yeah. And as guests of uh, the King Creon um, in Corinthus, and they're there now. Excuse me. Yes? King Creon ruling Thebes, not Corinth. Another King Creon there as well, a different another, another one. Another. Yes, this, his name was Creon as well, and he he's had a daughter whose name was Glafki, Gloss in English. So uh, now, the play Medea begins at the point where Jason is leaving his wife and children so that he can marry the young princess, the daughter of King Creon. Medea has found out that he's going to do that and she's threatening to take revenge upon her husband. So you can see what's happening. <clears throat> They're married, they have two children, but he tells her, he or she has heard, that he's going to marry the princess, who is young, and that's all we need to say. Young and beautiful and not his wife. So, and other reasons as well as we will see, but that's certainly one of them. Although Jason tells us there are other reasons as well. So this is where we're at. Now, keep in mind a few things while we're reading. Um, Medea came from what they used to call Barbary lands, barbarians. Anybody who wasn't Greek was a barbarian. But they were also considered kind of second class um, people, not as civilized as Greeks who lived in Greece. Um, so think of excessive pride. Does anyone have ex excessive pride? Um, does anyone have too much passion and not enough reason? Or does someone have too much reason and not enough passion? Uh, anger. There's a feeling there. Do we see it there? All these things, um, we'll keep that in mind as we are reading. Now, Medea, the first one. Medea's speech to the women of Corinth on finding out that her husband Jason is going to marry the daughter of King Creon of Corinth and he intends to banish Medea and the two boys. So, Medea comes out and addresses the women of Corinth, the chorus. I would not have you censure me, so I have come. Many I know are proud of heart, indoors or out, but others are ill spoken of as supercilious, just because their ways are quiet. There's no justice in the world's censorious eyes. They will not wait to learn a man's true character. Though no wrong has been done them, one look and they hate. Of course, a stranger must conform. Even a Greek should not annoy his fellows by crass stubbornness. I accept my place, but this blow that has fallen on me was not to be expected. It has crushed my heart. Life has no pleasure left, dear friends. I want to die. Jason was my whole life. He knows that well. Now he has proved himself the most contemptible of men. And she continues. Surely, of all creatures that have life and will, we women are the most wretched. When, for an extravagant sum, we have bought a husband, we must then accept him as possessor of our body. This is to aggravate wrong with worse wrong. Then the great question, will the man we get be bad or good? For women, divorce is not respectable. To repel the man, not possible. Still more, a foreign woman coming among new laws, new customs, needs the skill of magic to find out what her home could not teach her, how to treat the man whose bed she shares. And if in this exacting toil we are successful and our husband does not struggle under the marriage yoke, our life is enviable. Otherwise, death is better. If a man grows tired of the company at home, he can go out and find a cure for tediousness. We wives are forced to look to one man only, and they tell us we at home live free from danger. They go out to battle, fools. I'd rather stand three times in the front line than bear one child. 
But the same arguments do not apply to you and me. You have this city, your father's home, the enjoyment of your life, and your friend's company. I am alone. I have no city. Now my husband insults 